The national forest and parks in the United States is a vast land that covers almost 200 million acres. To say it's huge would be an understatement. Millions of people flock to these forests and parks every year for the beauty, the serenity, and yes, the adventures. Though coming to these woods is enjoyable, most understand the dangers that these destinations may hold. Being in the wild would lead one to automatically assume to be cautious of predators such as mountain lions and bears and countless more. If someone ventures into these areas in the winter, then common sense should tell them that cold temperatures can cause a problem for anyone who's not prepared. Same goes for those who venture out into the wild in the summertime. One would assume that the risk of heat-related illnesses are high. Even with all of this knowledge, people still choose to make their way to these beautiful destinations. But what if there was another danger out there? A danger that we don't know about. Could that change a person's mind? Probably not. But what if I told you that the danger is so real that every year across America, thousands of people go missing in these same national forests and parks? The majority of these people are found, but for some, well, they're not so lucky. When we hear of these stories, we're intrigued by them. We find them fascinating, interesting, and yes, sad and heartbroken by them as well. But have you ever just taken a moment to see how strange and mysterious some of these cases are? Cases where experienced hunters just vanish in areas they know better than anyone. Or moments when you're just 20 or 30 feet away from someone and you turn around for a quick moment only to turn back around and see that they're now gone just disappeared. You didn't hear any footsteps or running, and you know you weren't looking away long enough for them to get out of earshot, so you yell out to them, expecting them to respond. Yet, eerie silence is all that's around you. These are not isolated cases where only a few of these have happened over the last century. Hundreds of cases just like those I described have been documented, and in this new series, Mystery of the Missing, I will be sharing cases of fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and yes, even somebody's son and somebody's daughter, who made their way into the woods, but unfortunately, never found their way out. In 1974, traveling cross-country from Virginia, 19-year-old Charles McCuller was on an exciting new adventure. Unfortunately, this adventure would come to a screeching halt on January 30th, 1975. After getting dropped off by a park logger near the entrance to the Crater Lake National Forest, Charles would never be seen again, at least not alive. You see, the story surrounding the disappearance of Charles McCuller just adds to the many strange experiences so many others have had in and around Crater Lake over the years. But we'll get into some of that in a moment. McCuller was an aspiring photographer who wanted to photograph the outdoors and national parks throughout the country. But there was a problem with this adventure. Charles was not that experienced when it came to the outdoors. Nor was he really equipped to trek the trails, especially in the winter. In late January, Charles was staying with a friend in Eugene, Oregon. 
He discussed with his friend his desire to photograph the outdoors at Crater Lake during the winter time. The friend would later say that Charles had told him, If I don't return by February 1st, you should probably call the police. Thinking it was a joke at the time, that statement, unbeknownst to Charles, would actually become a reality. After failing to return on February 1st, the friend indeed would contact authorities. Authorities would then send out a search party for the missing 19-year-old Virginia native. Charles' father would make his way to Oregon from Virginia State to assist Oregon State Police and the National Park Service in the search for his son. He supplied the authorities with a list of items he thought that Charles might have had in his possession at the time of his disappearance. A couple of these items were his backpack and a key with a VW emblem on it. The search for Charles would continue for some time, but Charles nor any of his belongings were found. 21 months later in October of 1976, two people were hiking the PCT in Southern Oregon. The PCT is short for the famous Pacific Crest Trail. This historic trail stretches from Mexico throughout the west all the way up north to Canada. While making their way on this trail, the hikers see something in the distance that seemed a little out of place. Upon further investigation, they find a backpack, jeans, socks, and what appears to be part of a skull cap. Knowing that this entire scene is screaming trouble, they grab a couple of the items out of the backpack and set out searching for a park ranger. A short time later, they came across a ranger by the name of Marion Jack. Now, Ranger Jack was very familiar with the Charles McCuller case. He was one of the many rangers and searchers out searching for Charles. The hikers explained the disturbing scene that they had came across. But it wasn't until they showed Ranger Jack the items they pulled from the backpack that Ranger Jack knew immediately who they belonged to. He remembered the list of items that Charles' father had provided them. One of the items the hikers presented to the ranger was a key with a VW emblem on it, identical to the one that Charles' father believes his son was carrying at the time of his disappearance. Ranger Jack knew at this moment that they had finally found Charles McCuller this wouldn't be the end of the story. Ranger Jack and another ranger set out on horses to where the hikers had said the backpack and the rest of the items were located. Arriving at the area the hikers had described, the rangers were completely baffled at the scene that they came upon. They found part of a skull cap sitting in a gravel area and at a short distance they found Charles's pants and socks. This is where things get really strange. They described the pants to be not as weathered as one might assume they'd be after being out in the woods with all the elements for almost two years. The pants were unbuckled and unzipped and positioned as if someone had pulled them down, stepped out of them, and walked away. But if that is what happened, well, they walked away barefooted because their socks was found at the bottom of the pants. It was as if Charles had just completely evaporated into thin air and his pants just dropped to the ground. But even stranger, other items were completely gone. No shirt, no boots, all his camera equipment, gone. You would think that if an animal had came up and was curious and started to take items, then why was the pants and socks left completely untouched? Especially since the rangers had described finding a broken leg bone inside the pant leg. The scent of human bones would have gotten the attention of wild scavengers in the area. So why everything but these items? This makes me think that something else entirely is at play. However, not far away, they did find a skull that was sitting upside down, which was later identified to be that of Charles McCuller. Unfortunately, not much else would ever be found. Which brings us to the many mysterious experiences others have had over the years throughout Crater Lake National Forest. Another missing person case that I will be sharing later in this series also happened here at Crater Lake. A case of a young 8-year-old boy by the name of Sammy Balky, who completely vanished after running up a hill while playing with his father just mere feet behind him. How does that happen? And visitors are not the only ones to report strange happenings in the forest. Rangers have reported seeing some, well, very strange sightings they've came across over the years. One story involving a ranger I found interesting was that of a park ranger who was patrolling at night when she saw in the distance a group of people standing around a campfire. 
doesn't seem too mysterious, right? Well, the problem was in this particular part of the forest, campfires were not permitted. She thought to herself, maybe they just got a little confused on what areas are permitted and not permitted. So she drives through the forest a little ways to reach the campers to inform them that they would need to put out their fire and move their location. But when she arrived at where she saw them, she was completely shocked to find nothing. There was no campers. There was no campfire. There wasn't even any signs that anyone had a campfire at all. But she knows what she saw. And she knew she saw these campers all standing around a campfire. So where did they go? And if they all ran off, then why was there no fire? Or even a smoldering fire that just got put out by everyone before they ran away? None of this makes any sense. But other rangers have reported seeing a mysterious light over the years as well. As for the Charles McCuller case, authorities would speculate that Charles had just gotten lost and possibly injured and succumbed to the elements of the Crater Lake National Forest. Charles' parents, on the other hand, believe foul play had a huge role in their son's untimely death. I'm curious what you guys think. Drop your thoughts in the comments below. All the way on the other side of the country in New York State, an Army veteran and former hunting and survivalist instructor, 82-year-old Thomas Messick, made his way to the Lake George Wild Forest area for an annual camping trip with friends and family. On November 15, 2015, Tom and six members of his party walked into the woods near an area called Lily Pond to go deer hunting. This is an area that Tom and his hunting buddies has hunted for over 50 years. So I think it's safe to say, Tom knew this area well, extremely well. Unfortunately, this hunting trip would be like no other. Shortly after arriving, they all decided to run the brush, though I believe they called it a deer drive which is a technique that's often used by hunters who would move the deer out of the brush towards a specific direction into the open. In this case, Tom's hunting party would have three of their younger hunters, called drivers, drive the deer down towards the area where the four older hunters, called watchers, would be waiting. The four watchers would line up about a few hundred feet apart from each other, then head straight into the woods to get in position for any deer the drivers might push their way. Some of the guys from Tom's hunting party would later remark on how eerily silent it was while they were out there. There was no sign of any wildlife. No deer. No birds. They didn't even see any squirrels. Nothing. After a short time out there, they decided to call it a day. They all started making their way back to the location they all agreed to meet up at. Everyone would show up. Everyone. Except one. Thomas was nowhere in sight. Realizing that Thomas hadn't made it out yet, they tried to reach him on the walkie-talkie that he had with them. Unfortunately, those attempts would be to no avail, so they yell out for him. Still, nothing. They start searching the area where it was thought that Thomas was supposed to be, even firing a rifle in the air three times, a sign for distress something that an experienced hunter and survivalist would know to respond to if given the chance. But Thomas would never respond. Starting to worry, around 4.30 p.m., they would call the forest rangers to report Thomas missing. Four rangers would show up and help the group conduct another search. This search would last until around midnight. But again, Thomas was nowhere to be found. At this point, they all decided to go back to their vehicles and wait a while. They know Thomas is more than capable of making his way out of the woods, but to be sure, they all would honk their horns periodically throughout the night, hoping it would help Thomas find his way through the pitch black and out of the woods. By the next morning on November 16th, one day after Thomas would mysteriously disappear, a search party consisting of 13 search and rescue members was assembled to conduct an extremely organized search of the area, but again, they came up empty. Eventually, a huge search with over 300 people would start. This search would include helicopters searching from the air, canines searching from the ground with search and rescue members, as well as divers were brought in to check the nearby waters. In total, more than 15 different agencies were involved in the search for the 82-year-old veteran. 
and out of more than four square miles that was searched, nothing was found. Not a piece of clothing, his rifle, his walkie-talkie, nothing. Just like Charles McCuller, it's like Thomas had just evaporated into thin air. But as strange as this is, it gets stranger. By day four, the FBI would show up. Now if you're not asking yourself, why the hell would the FBI show up for a lost 82 year old in the woods? Well, you should be. Because it is highly unusual for the FBI to get involved in cases where adults are thought to be just lost in the woods. The days following the disappearance of Thomas, investigators would question the hunting group. One of them that was questioned would tell authorities something that he had heard around the same time that Thomas went missing. This information would intensify the mystery and strangeness of this case. Thinking it was no big deal at the time, Thomas's friend would tell investigators that he had heard a sound when he was walking back to meet up with the rest of the group. He would later be quoted as saying, I heard a strange noise in the woods, but I don't know what it was. Just a different noise from what I usually hear, you know? Something different that I have never heard before in the woods. I just can't say what it was. When confirming if he actually told authorities what he had heard, he said, Yeah, I told them that, but they just passed it off, you know? Later, that same friend would elaborate on what he had heard, saying it sounded like a snapping and whooshing sound. But why would the authorities pass this off? Maybe this sound was the key piece to the puzzle to find Thomas. And why would the FBI be there? Thomas's wife would later say that she was questioned by the FBI. She was quoted telling reporters, The FBI told me something isn't right with this case, but they don't know what. They won't share any theories if they have them. The FBI said until they make a discovery, they're never going to know. Almost seven years has passed since Thomas vanished in the Lake George Wild Forest. And just like with the Charles McCuller case, so many questions are still left unanswered. One thing is for certain. Even anyone who knows the woods better than most, just like Thomas Messick, are not immune to disappearing in those same woods they feel comfortable and confident in. And to avoid being added to the list of those who vanished in the woods of America, never go unprepared. Invest in GPS tracking devices, personal locator beacons, compasses, waterproof matches, and much more so you can always maximize your chances of survival if anything happens that is unexpected while you're in the woods. What do you think happened to these two individuals in these two cases? Do you think supernatural is at play, or do you think it's just a run of bad luck? Let us know your thoughts on both these cases in the comments below. And don't forget, Thomas is still missing, so if you have any information that possibly might help authorities lead to finding Thomas, contact the number below. Furthermore, never let your guard down and think that you were the only one hunting out in the woods. Never forget that just maybe, you are the one that is being hunted. <laughs>